Hello, welcome back to another podcast, and it's podcast number 10. Yes, we can scarcely believe it. It is our last week of university now. Um, yeah, Chris shaking his head um, next to me. Um, good afternoon, Chris. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, how did you just get on in your shorthand test? Yeah, I attempted 60 words per minute today, and it is fair to say that I have failed. Yes, I think I might have failed as well, as Will would say. Um, <laughs> yes, it's our final week at in this university term. <laughs> Um, podcast number 10 so yeah we did uh, we started the podcast in week two of university we did one in reading week and then um, now we've reached December and the last week and um, number 10 so on the agenda today um, more of the u- usual stuff plenty of football to um, talk about this week plus uh, a bit of snooker um, a bit of cricket and then a look ahead to the sport that's going on over Christmas mm. um, so starting with uh, another win for Tottenham in the Premier League under yes. Jose Mourinho Three out of three for Mourinho. Uh, Tottenham uh, beat Bournemouth three goals to two on Saturday afternoon. Uh, I think the the key point, the key talking point from this game is the form of Deli Ali at the moment. Uh, mm. He was uh, scrutinised uh, a lot under Pochettino, though he wasn't performing well. And now Pochettino left, and he's been uh, man of the match in three games. Sure. Uh, in three games that Mourinho. Uh, who, do, who does that? Who does that say more about? I, I'm not sure. I mean. <laughs> that you know begs a question: Was there sort of was was what was the relationship between Deli Ali and Mauricio Pochettino? But apparently, it was quite good because the player himself visited Pochettino when he heard that he was sacked. But then again, his performances on the pitch say complete, say something completely different. Um, so uh, back to the game anyway. Bournemouth, uh, Deli Ali scoring twice on 21 minutes and 50 minutes, and Musa Sissoko scoring mm. his. Uh, for the first time in, in a while, and he, he was trolling himself on social media. He posted a photo of himself on Instagram saying, did I score a goal? Question mark. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Jan Vertonghen with a brilliant reply saying, it was a cross uh, that found its way to the goal. Um, yeah, the, uh, another thing is our defence once again uh, conceding two goals in the last 20 minutes. Uh, Harry Wilson with a double on 73 minutes and 90, uh, 96 so um so far, having watched um watched Spurs, have you seen no- any noticeable changes under Mourinho, or just a bit more hunger from the players? I I, th- I think that yeah, as you said, the most noticeable change is the hunger. In terms of squad and players, th- there is not much variety that you can go for. Um, but I think that the biggest difference that I've seen in the past three games is that threat going forward. Mm. Uh, so if attack when, when when we're on attack, we we get bodies in the box, we we push all together. Uh, but again, the, the biggest question for Mourinho will be the fence and whether he does something about it in January, we shall see. But then again, what, what, what is he going to do? Who is he going to add? Who is he going to get rid of? Uh, we'll find out. Yes, uh, very good. Um, across the border then, um, I for once had a trip home that was worth it after the last <laughs> few months. Um, yeah, it was a long day for me. Left home at nine, didn't get back till eleven. So Oof. spent yeah, spent about well, spent six hours travelling, and then the rest in the fine city of Norwich. Um, two all draw with Arsenal, um, having just sacked Unai Emery and had Freddie Lundberg yes. um, in charge. Arsenal started well, to be honest. Um, there was a bit of zip about them, a bit of flair. They looked you know a bit more hungry than they had in previous weeks, um, but they couldn't make the dominance count. And then we went ahead through uh, Timu Puki. Yes, the Puki party is back on. And we got a bit of good luck as well. Deflected shot went in. That's been rare for us this season. But that was undone about five minutes later, um, thanks to uh, giving away a penalty. Um, it was a penalty, but what followed was quite remarkable, to be honest, and concerns um, what we seem to mention um, every week. Um, yes, uh, VAR. So, Aubameyang, he takes his penalty. It gets saved by Tim Krull and cleared by Max Ahrens. But I don't know who brought brought it to the attention to the referee. I don't know if Arsenal complained about it because it didn't look like it. Um, Aaron's was adjudged, although I only thought his body was in the area. Um, he was adjudged to have been in the area when the penalty was taken. And because he cleared the ball, um, the law is if the player encroaching um, has an impact on what happens after the penalty is missed, then the penalty is retaken. But um, looking at the replays, it looked like he was just sort of um, leaning forward and then yeah. his foot weren't actually in the area. Nevertheless, uh, you see this happen all the time um, in football. Players are always in the box, and um, I don't, I just don't know why. It, you know, it was, it was, it was retaken. From an Irish fan's perspective, we were thinking if that had happened down the other end, because we're not a so-called big club, there's no way it would have been overturned. But because it was, because it was Arsenal, um, it was. That's a simplistic way to view it, obviously. 
But um, it does make you think in the next few weeks or months, um, a referee's going to be looking, looking out for this more often in penalties? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it's, it's, it's been an ongoing debate since the, the Women's World Cup, really, last summer. Um, when the, the issue of you know t- taking and retaking penalties had, had, had been raised, and the, the sudden law change as well, um, I think you know the thing is with with penalties, the team who concede a penalty are on the losing end already. So I don't feel like we should punish the goalkeepers even more. So, so just just going back to the law that the goalkeeper's feet, at least one foot, must mm. remain on the line. I mean, he is you know he's he's going to be on the losing end. He's a disadvantaged one. So why are we punishing them more, you know, than the than the penalty takers? But I think it will it will be an ongoing issue for for quite some time. What it felt like again was just um, VAR getting involved yeah. when it didn't really need to be. Okay, the decision, you might argue, was still correct, but this happens week in yeah. week out, and why is this now the first time that something the, the, um, yeah, has the, been done about it? The question it? is, who decides? to sort of flag up something to the, to, the, to the referee in charge. Who is it? Where does he get the message from? Is it the players on the pitch that have raised, as you said, in, in, in the Norwich game, the issue? Or is it, does he get the message in his earpiece saying that, you know, something's happened? And the thing is, the, uh, the, the, the pitch side monitors are not being used at all. Which no, I don't understand that. No, they it's used bizarre. them at the World Cup, didn't yeah, they? But, exactly, yeah. Um, yes, enough on that. Um, Norwich retook the lead through Todd Campbell just before half-time, again against the run of play. But um, Norwich being clinical, which is what you've got to be if you want to stay up in the Premier League. Um, and then a soft equaliser conceded after half-time to Aubameyang. But I'm pleased to say that um, Norwich dominated the last third of the game. And we had three or four really good chances. Um, Arsenal's keeper Leno made three or four great saves. And he was the reason, um, I think, that they got a draw. Plus uh, Amadou's block for Norwich in the last minute. Um, my heart was in my mouth watching that moment. <laughs> I think it was like 94 minutes on the clock. We want the point. Um, but yeah, four points in two games for Norwich after a very, very poor run of form. It's not much of a coincidence because, um, or it's not a coincidence that we've started playing well since Crystal Zimmerman has come back into the team and we look like we've got roughly our strongest 11 out again. Um, injuries do play uh, a big role in how, how good or bad a team can be, certainly for us. Um, yes, yeah, so that's um, Norwich was still 19th, but a big game coming up this week, which we will get to uh, later. Uh, the rest of the Premier League, um, Liverpool then, 11 points clear of Man City. Yeah. Still only eight clear of Leicester, who got themselves another win. But um, um, what's happening? What's happening to Pep and City? I had no idea. I mean, they've had issues in the Champions League as well, in the Premier League. But um, they're, they're slacking now. They're, they're, I think they're too far behind to catch... Uh, catch Liverpool, and for me, I think Leicester are emerging mm. as the, the 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 number one sort of opponent for for the title. Yeah, uh, they, Le- Leicester look very very. They have done for a while, but yeah, um, that win against Everton, the ninety was a ninety fourth minute, ninety fourth minute yes. Ikenacho, uh winner uh, against Everton, and they're only what eight points behind uh, behind Liverpool now. Um, Liverpool as well, we should mention, will be missing Fabinho until twenty twenty. Who's ruled out with a hip injury, but it will be very interesting to see what happens. A uh, big win for West Ham away at Chelsea and uh, Watford, um, beating Southampton. Then uh, they conceded two goals in a short space of time and lost the game, and that meant uh, Kike Sanchez Flores mm. um, received the sack uh, yesterday. I mean, what what's going on at Watford? I'm embarrassed to say that Norwich lost to them, but um, they're they're going through managers um, ridiculously and <laughs> really quickly. Um, I'm not sure. I think I saw Chris Hutton was looking like the favourite yeah. to be appointed yeah. um, today. But I think yeah, Watford, Watford might finally um, uh, go down. And just yeah, the way the club's being managed just seems really uh, just really odd. They've been an, they've been an established team in this league for yeah. a while, but um, they just seem to be losing it a little bit now. It's just too erratic at the moment. There's too many changes. Players need to get used to a particular system. And what I've uh, I've talked about a lot is is consistency. Players prefer consistency. For example, I did an interview uh, with, a, with a sports psychologist about uh, about the issue of racism in football, and I, and I said to him, so what does what does make a player comfortable? What what is it that makes him comfortable and and makes him play well? And and, and he said that the, the the most important thing is consistency. So he mentioned at, at Tottenham as well how Pochettino changed the formation to a diamond formation from the beginning of the season and it simply didn't work and the players were confused, they were getting tired. The most important thing is uh, consistency and when the players haven't got that consistency in the team, as you know, Watford changing managers every time, they're, 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 there's no consistency whatsoever and that shows uh, straight away. Very good. Um, 
fantasy football this week. A uh, better week for me, actually, thanks to um, Sunday. I had four players contribute yesterday. I had Dirty scored for Wolves, Campwell scored for Norwich, Aubameyang scored two for Arsenal, and uh, Vardy scored for Leicester. So 61 points, um, about 10 or so, I think. Um, above the average, had Vardy as captain, and uh, he didn't let me down this week, and I'll probably uh, keep keep it like that for a while. Um, should have had some Liverpool defenders in this week, mm. although they haven't been keeping many clean sheets, but um, Trent Alexander-Arnold and Virgil van Dijk both got, I think, two assists and two goals, um, respectively, uh, this week. Yeah, for me, uh, a decent week, average week, 52 points. I had Virgil van Dijk in my defence, so he got me 17 points. Um, I had Sterling as captain, who got me 14 points, and the rest, two two points, one point, so very, very, very average. OK, uh, the championship um, this week uh, wins again for West Brom um, and Leeds, and suddenly there's a lot more of a gap between the top two um, yeah. and the rest of the league, Chris. Uh, yes, there is. Uh, as we mentioned last week, the gap was sort of expanding, but uh, now between third and first there's already five a five point gap between fourth and first it raises to eight points um, towards the bottom of the table very similarly as well uh, there's a gap between uh, the 18 threading and 24 Barnsley uh, and that gap is at nine points already so expanding yeah. Yes, um, massive period, isn't it, over Christmas? Because I think it's eight games each team's yeah, got in it's December. Something ridiculous. So you know, I mean, for for Premier League championship and all other leagues, you know, it can be make or break if you pick up sort of five, six wins um, over Christmas, or turn to really lose five or six games. You can slide down the league or um, jump up the league. Hopefully, for um, uh, Norwich, we can get uh, two or three wins over the Christmas period and get our season fully back on track. But uh, if you're not careful, you may get cut adrift mm. um, as well. OK, we will talk about the Champions League and Europa League results uh, in just a moment. But first, um, the Euro 2020 groups, um, the draw for that uh, took place um, on Saturday. And there was one particular group, wasn't there, Chris, yeah. that um, uh, doesn't, look very, yeah. doesn't look very good if you're in it. No, it does not. We're talking about Group F, which consists of Portugal, France and Germany and a playoff winner. Uh, so I, I feel uh, sorry for the playoff winner. Uh, in that mm. group, uh, but very interesting group. Uh, mind you, only two teams will go out, so we're going to lose a potential, potential, um, you know, winner at the group stages already. I think whichever team wins that group will win the whole thing. To be yeah, honest, if you if you get through a group, if you get through a group group with Portugal, France, and Germany, then you're definitely going to be good exactly. enough to. Um, to win the tournament. Um, the groups for England and Wales? Uh, England will face Croatia and Czech Republic and a playoff winner uh, is... Yeah, it could be Scotland, well. couldn't it? Could be, could be Scotland, could be Scotland or Norway. Uh, and then for Wales, uh, uh, who are in Group A, they will face Turkey, Italy and Switzerland. Also a very tough yeah, group. Yeah, I, I, I think to fair, I think Wales might like that group, actually. Yeah. Um, definitely got a good chance of getting through. Uh, other groups include Group B, uh, which consists of Denmark, Finland, Belgium and Russia. Group C is uh, the Netherlands, Ukraine, Austria and a playoff winner. Uh, group E is Spain, Sweden, Poland and a playoff winner. Also a very strong group. OK, very good. Uh, on to uh, European football that took place this week. Uh, these were the main results on the Champions League. Uh, the next match day, uh, Tottenham 4, Olympiacos 2, Man City 1, Shakhtar Donetsk 1. Valencia 2, Chelsea 2 and Liverpool 1, Napoli 1. Um, you must have been worried for a while watching Tottenham. Yeah, no, uh, it went down in the first 20 minutes. Uh, so that was definitely uh, worrying, some worrying, worrying signs. Um, but uh, we got back. Uh, the Mourinho uh, changed uh, Eric Dyer after 28 minutes of playing, which was a very tough decision. He apologised. Uh, to the player after the game, uh, apparently it was just a tactical change. You had nothing mm. to do with with the player. Uh, yeah, good old Mourinho. Yeah, <laughs> he replaced Dyer with Eriksson, uh, and after that, uh, Deli Ali with uh, uh, one goal back uh, before half time. Harry Kane equalising thanks to our amazing ball boy on 50 minutes, and then Serge Aurier and Harry Kane uh, scoring on 73 and 77 minutes respectively to uh, send us through to the uh, last 16th of the Champions League. So, um, who who do you fancy in the in the knockout stages? 
I'm really excited for the draw. I mean, we have no chance to uh, come out first from the group, so it will be a tough opponent. But um, I think facing, uh, I don't know, facing Barcelona wouldn't be... Uh, PSG, PSG or Barcelona, I'd say. Okay. PSG or Barcelona. Uh, just quickly touching on the Europa League. Uh, Astana 2, Man United 1, Braga 3, Wolves 3. That was a good game, mm -hmm. saw that one. Um, Arsenal 1, Frankfurt 2, which uh, spelled the end for Unai, Unai Emery. Emery. Uh, it was coming, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was. I'm just, I was just surprised that Pochettino went before him. But of a very poor run of results, uh, I'm not surprised that the fans had enough. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it was just simply time for him to go. I mean... Uh, the last time they won was against uh, Victoria Guimaraes and that was in Europa League. That was 3-2 and that was on the 24th of October. Yeah, I mean, the thing I sort of said about Arsenal, that Arsenal team I watched yesterday was probably the worst Arsenal team I've seen play yeah. Norwich in, um, well, I've been, on the, I've been on the planet for 19 years. So, mm. um, yeah, I can see why they were getting so frustrated and it's just they just had sort of the components of a mid-table team, yeah, really. Yeah. Like, I mean, a good... Good striker, world-class striker in Aubameyang, but their defence was almost as bad as ours, um, I have to say. And like, it was only thanks to their keeper that uh, they got the draw um, in the end. So plenty of work to do for um, whoever comes in um, there. Moving on to um, a cricket update for this week, and I can speak a bit more positively about England um, after the last few days. We'll also talk about Australia and Pakistan, the second test match there. So um, England against New Zealand in New Zealand in the second test. They look to have secured um, at least a draw in the second test against New Zealand in Hamilton. Um, tail of the test then, Joe Root won the toss and he put New Zealand into bat on what was looking like quite a green pitch, but um, England uh, playing five seamers. Um, very strange decision, failed to make inroads early and they took just three wickets on a rain affected day one. Uh, they bowled New Zealand out for 375 after Tom Latham scored a century um, and they slipped to 39 for two at the close of day two so it wasn't looking too good then but an excellent day three saw Joe Root and Rory Burns score centuries. Uh, England got to 269 for five. Um, Root doubled up on day four. I watched a bit of this, um, making 226 in England's 476 all-out um, pitch was extremely flat, I um, have to say. Uh, they took two wickets in New Zealand's second innings before Ross Taylor and Kane Williamson stabilised the innings. Um, New Zealand closing on 96 for two, uh, five runs ahead in the match. Um, there is one day left, but unfortunately there is rain forecast for that, so the chances of a result um, this evening are slim. But yeah, that one starts at half past nine um, at UK time. Uh, if you're going to watch a bit of that, I uh, probably will, um, but uh, depending on what time uh, the rain comes, I'll probably uh, have an early night. Um, anyway, across the border to Australia, they thrashed Pakistan for the second match in a row. Uh, David Warner, he broke the records this time. Um, the Aussie powerhouse scored 335 in the first innings, along with Marnus Labuschagne, who scored his second consecutive century in a knock of 162. Um, Pakistan's fertilities with the bat were exposed under the lights. It, yeah, it was a day-night test, so using the pink ball. Um, and they made just 302, and 113 of that came from tail end uh, Yasir Shah, um, and actually a leg spinner. Uh, he made his maiden test 100. Uh, Australia enforced the follow-on for once, very rare for an Australian team to do that, and they took three more wickets on day three and almost had the series wrapped up. Um, they did just that um, uh, this morning, um, finishing the job and completing another innings victory, um, this time bowling out Pakistan for 239. Uh, five wickets for Nathan Lyon and three for Josh Hazelwood, while Asa Chafiq was the only one who offered any resistance for Pakistan, scoring 57. Uh, Australia hosts New Zealand in the middle of the month, um, which is going to be quite an intriguing series, definitely one I'm going to um, be watching. So um, the question for this um, goes out to any sport. Um, how difficult is it to play um, sport overseas sort of, you know, in conditions that aren't familiar with you? Like we, we talk about the Champions League, teams, mm. teams struggling to play. Mm. Um, in other countries, what you know, what factors come into play? Um, number one is it's probably the, the distance. I mean, players have got families as well, and they they sort of want to spend time with them. And especially, you know, when you're far away from your loved ones, it, it definitely affects you as well. It's the language, the language barrier. I mean, when you when you don't speak a language, you have to learn it first to, in order to communicate, which takes a uh, while. Um, m maybe. The, players are you know are sort of scared of, of, of those things and we, we, we don't see many English players playing outside of the Premier League do we uh, the only one that comes to mind right now is is, is Jadon Sancho who plays for for Borussia Dortmund but but you know players 
tend to stay here closer to you know to what they know and what they're what they're confident about yes um yeah, agree with um, most of those uh, points, especially for cricket. It's just uh, the, the, you know, the change from playing um, in English conditions and straight over to mm. New Zealand. Um, obviously, the, the, the cricket season ended late September and then there's playing New Zealand sort of just a month and a half later. And um, you need to practice in these places and you need to sort of go, a season, go overseas and have experience, um, be able to make big scores in other countries because the majority of those England players don't really have much overseas experience and it's hard to ask them um, when they're going out there for the first time um, to, be, to be able to adapt and uh, to perform well uh, in those conditions, uh, especially with Australia and uh, Pakistan. Australia are so, so good on home turf and they're probably one of the hardest teams to beat, although India, India managed to do it last year. Um, but, um, yeah, they're ridiculously strong. Um, and I, I can't really see England winning another Ashes series there um, unless we get a very, very good team. So, yeah, you've got to, got to get experience of those conditions um, and, you know, spend quite a lot of time out there. Like, sometimes it could take years to um, to learn the right technique um, in other countries, but, um, yeah, the cricket players don't have that as we have our home summer to um, focus on. But uh, positive signs for England in this Test match after the first one, which was a bit of a shambles, um, really. Finally, the uh, UK Championship uh, snooker. i um, been watching a bit of this this week. We've had two rounds so far of the UK snooker championship at the York Barbican. Uh, Ronnie O'Sullivan and favourite Judd Trump are both through to the third round after relatively comfortable victories. Um, Trump won the Masters in January as well as the World Championships at the Crucible in May. So um, he is on course to complete the Triple Crown and win all three major tournaments. Um, uh, what an achievement uh, that would be. So... Chris, um, how's your snooker and how's your pool? <laughs> oh, let's let's not talk about it. But um, yeah, very rusty, very rusty. Last time I've played was on holiday uh, two years ago. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, not good, not good <laughs> at all. <laughs> yes, um, the difference between snooker and pool is huge. And if you if you don't if you don't agree with me, then I advise you to one day take a trip down your local snooker club. <laughs> and um, uh, have a couple of frames and then you'll realise it's very different to playing pool in a pub on a Saturday night when you've, yeah. been, um, when you've had a couple of drinks. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, snooker is um, like when I first started, I've been playing for a couple of years now, but um, sometimes frames would take like nearly an hour, whereas you see some professionals um, get through frames in sort of 10 minutes, which yeah. is um, remarkable. OK, our preview section for the next uh, week and also the Christmas period. We've already spoken a little bit about the importance of all the football matches um, over Christmas, but looking ahead um, just to the next seven days for Norwich, it's a huge game on Wednesday away to Southampton. Um, Southampton picking up that home win against Watford on Saturday. And um, yes, it's a six-pointer, really. That's all that can be said. Um, I've got confidence that Norwich can go there and get a good result, but um, it's still an away from home uh, in the Premier League. And um, yeah, just Norwich need to use the confidence and the momentum built from the last two games. Otherwise, uh, if we get beaten there, I feel like uh, the four points away at Everton and at home to Arsenal have been a bit of a waste. Really, got to beat these teams around us, um, not just to get points on the board, but to take to take points off them and push them further into the relegation mix. On Sunday, it's another Sunday game for Norwich. At th um, Sunday, two o'clock, Norwich against uh, Sheffield United. Um, which uh, could be a tougher game, to be fair, than the Southampton one, um, doing very well under Chris Wilder at the moment. Uh, some huge games coming up for Tottenham uh, as well. Humongous game for Jose Mourinho on Wednesday night, uh, who will be back at Old Trafford to oh, face... that's going to be tasty. Manchester United, uh, then back in North London uh, to face Burnley, uh, then the last game of the Champions League group stages against Bayern Munich away. Over Christmas, uh, we, Tottenham are going to be facing Wolves, um, a huge game against Chelsea on the 22nd of December, followed by a game against Brighton on the 26th, and finally Norwich and Southampton on the 28th of December and the 1st of January. And after that, the 11th of January marked the date Tottenham versus Liverpool at White Hart Lane. Yes, yeah, such a critical point in the season. Sometimes you get up, you get to after Christmas and you just say, yeah. "Can we start next season again?" <laughs> <laughs> um, hopefully, that won't be the case for either of us. Uh, Cricket-wise, over Christmas and then in the next two weeks, um, I've got the final day of the England-New Zealand uh, Test match uh, tonight, and then England head to South Africa to take part in another overseas tour, and they've got uh, three tests there, along with some limited overs contests. Um, Australia, they'll play New Zealand in a couple of weeks in some test matches, which uh, will be quite exciting, but I think the Aussies uh, will be too strong for them. 
Um, UK Snooker Championship, the latter half of that takes place this week at the York Barbican. And yes, Judge, Judge Trump looking to complete his triple crown. And finally, uh, the World Darts Championship, that gets underway uh, in just over a week's time at the Alexandra Palace in London. And it's set to be a fantastic tournament to finish what has been a bumper year in the world of darts. And I will be watching that um, all over Christmas as it's on literally like six hours a day um, for about 14 days straight. So that's going to be my activity sorted when I'm bored. And just finally, uh, on the future of the podcast, yes, 10 weeks in, um, yes, lots of talking done. Um, hope you guys have all enjoyed it um, and we do plan to try and switch it up a little bit next year so in terms of who's on um, whether we include more content from um, outside the room that we're recording in so like interviews and perhaps um, yeah, other things and um, yeah, in terms of uh, uh, our lives themselves uh, we've both had I think a decent term at university um, both at 40 words per minute at shorthand although Chris attempted 60 today but 60 is <laughs> a long way from me I'm, I'm trying to go for 50 at the moment um, what's been your favourite module? Favourite module? Favourite module this year? I'd probably have to say audio and video, but mm. the, the, the radio side of, of, of the module, yeah, which I'm doing right now. Other oh. modules haven't been that great this year, to be fair. I'm look, we're looking forward to it next time because uh, both of us are going to be doing uh, sports journalism, so that will be uh, quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely hope that's good. I've actually kind of enjoyed some lessons of power of without power. responsibility. Yeah. Um, there's been some quite interesting stuff there, but otherwise it's been a, a fairly dry term. I think we've yeah. learnt, learnt some interesting stuff, but I think it's all going to hot up um, in next term. Um, so, yeah, just rounding off, um, any plans over Christmas? No, I'm just going back home, uh, back here for New Year's, and uh, we'll take it from there, revising for uh, Power with our Responsibility exam on the 14th of January. Yes, yeah, so similar for me. I think I'll head home in about 10 days' time and probably stay here for just a bit longer and see some other Christmas things in London and then yes head home and pretty much watch the darts watch the football watch the football watch the um, darts practice shorthand every day <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, revise for the exam and yeah see how it goes um, hopefully enjoy in, enjoy the end of the year yeah Merry Christmas everyone